Welcome everybody, learning as a hobby here. Um, I, as promised, <laughs> want to do the video on chapter, this chapter six summary for Spivak, which I'm gonna do in this video. Um, so let's get to it. But actually before I get to chapter six, I do want to just make a small correction to one of the problems in part two of um, the chapter five solutions that I posted yesterday for Spivak. Uh, so in question 22, um, there is this uh, biconditional statement that we are proving, uh, prove that um, uh, if G is any function for which limit X goes to zero, G of X does not exist, then limit X goes to zero of F of X plus G of X also does not exist. Uh, if and only if limit as X goes to zero, F of X does exist. So there's a if and only if proof that we have to do. Um, and the only if, direction that I proved was fine, but I just want to um, correct the if direction. And I did this in the in the um, the, the uh, description box in that video, but I wanted to do, you know, do it uh, in another video at the beginning, just so pe people, because uh, I don't know if everyone looks at the description boxes. So I just wanted to start with that. So here's the, the if direction, the proof for the if direction. So assume that limit x goes to zero, f of x equals some uh, real number m and limit x goes to zero of f of x plus g of x is f for, for uh, is equal to some real number l, you know, meaning that the limit of f of x exists and the limit of f plus g exists as x goes to zero, but that limit x goes to zero of g of x is, does not exist. So I'm assuming the uh, I'm going to do this by contradiction. In other words, I'm assuming that the um, hypothesis here is true, but the conclusion is false. Then we'll we'll um, de derive our contradiction. Th so then uh, limit x goes to zero of f of x plus g of x minus limit x goes to zero of f of x is actually equal to limit g of x just by some algebra and theorem two from, chap from uh, the uh, chapter summary of chapter five. Uh, and this thing here is equal to L minus M, which is a real number, but that contradicts the fact that we assumed that the limit as X goes to zero of G of X did not exist. So that's your contradiction. So that proves both um, both directions for that by conditional statement. So I just wanted to fix that at the beginning of this video. And now we can move on to chapter six. Okay. So chapter six is quite short. So this, I think this video is gonna be really short. Um, because what chapter six is about is continuity of functions. So we start with the definition of what it means for a function to be continuous at a point. Uh, most of the machinery that we need for these, for the topic here has already been built in chapter five. So, which is why this chapter is, is kind of short. So uh, we'll just go through everything that's in there, all the important stuff. Like I said, as I usually do, um, uh, my summary is here, just a skeleton of the chapter. So you should read the chapter yourself. But like I said, I just picked out all the you know salient details and I'll go over them here. So we start with the definition of a uh, function being continuous at a point. So we say the function f is continuous at the point a if limit as x goes to a of f of x equals f of a. So in other words, if the limit uh, approaches the actual function value, then we say the function is continuous at that point. Right, and uh, we jump right into our first theorem. If f and g are continuous at a, then f plus g is continuous at a. f times g is continuous at a. Moreover, if g of a is not zero, then one over g is continuous at a. And I'll, we'll I'll, we'll prove this, but it's basically just uh, this follows uh, almost directly from theorem two from chapter five. But let's take a look at the proof. All right, so here let f and g be continuous at a. Then consider the limit as x goes to a of the function f plus g of x. By definition, that's the limit of x, uh, the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus g of x, which by theorem two is equal to limit as x goes to a of f of x plus limit as x goes to a of g of x, which is equal to f of a plus g of a because we assume that f and g were continuous at a, uh, which is the same uh, thing as f plus g evaluated at a by definition. So that shows that f plus g is continuous at that point, okay? And then 
uh, same idea for the product. So take the limit as x goes to a of f times g of x. By definition, that's the same thing as the limit as x goes to a of f of x times g of x, which is equal to limit x goes to a of f of x times limit x goes to a of g of x. That's by theorem two, again, from chapter five. Uh, and since f and g are continuous at a, that's equal to f of a times g of a, which is just the definition of f times g of a. All right, and then last case, Assume in addition to G being continuous at A that G of A is not zero. Then if we look at limit X goes to A of one over G of X, then that's equal to limit as X goes to A of one over G of X, which is the same thing from theorem uh, two again from chapter five as limit X goes to A of one over limit as X goes to A of G of X, which is equal to one over G of A again, because G is continuous at A and it's not zero. And that's the definition of one over G evaluated at A. And that shows all three cases hold. So like I said, it's just basically a direct consequence of um, theorem two from chapter five. All right. Uh, here's the more formal definition, you know, using the, the limit definition from chapter five. We say limit as X goes to A of F of X equals F of A. That means for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists delta greater than zero, such that for all x, if x, absolute value x minus a is less than delta, then absolute value f of x minus f of a uh, is less than epsilon. All right? Notice that uh, I let we left out the zero greater than here. Uh, be, that's because we don't need it because uh, if um, if x is equal to a, then this is obviously less than any positive epsilon because it's equal to zero. So actually we don't have to worry about that that uh, part of the definition here if we're looking at continuity at a point. All right, <clears throat> here's the next theorem. Theorem two, um, if G is continuous at A and if F is continuous at G of A, then F composed with G is continuous at A. So here we're getting, we're um, looking at the um, the continuity, excuse me, just readjust here. We're looking at the continuity of a composite function. So here's the proof. Again, we're just going to use the definition of uh, continuity and of limits to do this. So let f and g satisfy the above hypotheses. Then for epsilon greater than zero, there exists some delta one, uh, some positive delta one, such that f of z minus f of g of a is less than epsilon whenever absolute value z minus g of a is less than delta. Since G is continuous at A, there exists a delta two such that's greater than zero, such that absolute value G of X minus G of A less than delta one, when absolute value X minus A is less than delta two, right? Uh, that follows from the continuity of G of X. The delta one is just some, again, some positive constant. So it doesn't matter if you call it epsilon or delta one, but we want this delta one here so that this will be true, right? Then for any absolute value X minus A less than delta two, G of X, absolute value G of X minus G of A is less than delta two. Um, I'm sorry, there should be delta one here. That's a typo. This should be delta one. Uh, that, and that implies that absolute value F of G of X minus F of G of A is less than epsilon. And that proves that uh, theorem two is true. So if F and G are continuous in the way specified in the hypothesis, then the composite is, is continuous at the, the input value. All right, some uh, in definitions for uh, being F uh, function being continuous on an interval, uh, which is important. Um, we'd like, we like functions that are continuous on some interval because they, in some senses, in some sense are sort of like the nicest type of functions. They have uh, very nice properties. So let's start with uh, definition. So uh, one, we say the function F is continuous on the open interval from A to B. If F is continuous for each X in the interval from A to B. Similarly, we say F is continuous on the set of real numbers, which is, you know, the interval from negative infinity to infinity. If F is continuous at X for all X in R. And then finally, we say F is continuous on the closed interval from A to B if uh, there's two conditions here. Uh, if F is continuous on the open interval from A to B, and in addition to that, limit 
as x approaches a from above of f of x has to be f of a. So you know f evaluated at the lower endpoint of the interval. And limit as x approaches b from below of f of x has to be equal to f of b, which is f evaluated at the upper endpoint of the interval. So these are one-sided limits here. Uh, or a, a more compact way of saying this, I guess, would be uh, we say that f is continuous on its, um, you know, on some how do I say it? F is con uh, continuous on its domain if, you know, limit X goes to A of F of X equals F of A for all A in the domain of F. I guess you could say it like that. All right. Uh, and then basically there's one last theorem. Like I said, this is a very short section. So this is the last thing that we'll look at. Theorem three, suppose F is continuous at A and f of a is greater than zero, then f of x is greater than zero for all x in some interval containing a. More precisely, there's a number delta greater than zero such that f of x is greater than zero for all x satisfying absolute value x minus a less than delta. And similarly, if f of a is negative rather than positive, then there's a number delta greater than zero such that f of x is less than zero for all x satisfying x minus a less than delta. So let's prove that and um, then we can, uh, I can start working on the exercises for uh, this section. So um, here's the proof. Let f be, a, we'll, we'll prove the first case to start with where f of a is positive. Let f be continuous at a and let f of a greater than zero. Then there exists a delta greater than zero such that for all x where absolute value x minus a less than delta uh, implies that absolute value f of x minus f of a is less than one half times f of a. Remember, f of a is assumed to be a positive number here. Okay, then just expanding this absolute value inequality, um, that's a, that means the same thing as negative one half f of a less than f of x minus f of a, less than one half f of a. That's just a, a compound inequality that's, you know, equivalent to the in, um, absolute value inequality that we have here. And then you just add f of a to all three sides. So that gives us that one half f of a is less than f of x is less than three halves f of a. But notice that one half f of a is greater than zero. Therefore, f of x is greater than zero on the entire interval from a to minus delta to a plus delta. All right, so that proves that case. The next case is, is exactly analogous. The only difference is uh, here we're going to, you know, if we assume that f of a is less than zero, then we can find a neighborhood where this is true. And then just, again, using the same uh, process here, we get that three halves f of a is less than f of x is less than one half f of a. But no, he, in this case, the assumption was f of a was negative. So that shows that f of x is less than zero for all x in the neighborhood here. And that proves both both uh, statements here. All right, that's chapter six. So let me just stop the screen share. Um, yeah, so that's chapter six. Like I said, very short chapter, but that's because we did mainly all of the hard work in chapter five. So uh, I'll I haven't started on the exercise sets for the exercise set for this sec this chapter yet, but uh, I will start at them soon and hopefully I'll have uh, the video for that posted um, hopefully within the next week. Uh, and then we can move on to uh, we can move up to, to chapter seven. There's two more chapters left is chapter seven and chapter eight in section two. Uh, and then finally, we'll get up to the, <laughs> we'll finally get up to uh, de derivatives and integrals, I guess, which he does in chapter, in uh, section three, uh, starting in chapter nine. So yeah, we're moving ahead. Uh, like I said, my goal was to get through um, section two in Spivak this month. So I'm moving ahead with that and uh, hopefully we'll be able to accomplish that. Uh, within the, the time frame that I set for myself, uh, I think it should be doable um, because, uh, like I said, this section ended up being kind of short. So I just got to work on the exercises and then we can go right on to ch ch chapter seven. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Let me know what you think. Uh, do give the channel a, uh, the video a, a like and subscribe to the channel if you like this content uh, because it helps me out. And of course, there's the Patreon page and so on. Um, Check it out if, if uh, you want to see some extra material that uh, I post on there. It's only $5 a month. So I'll see you guys in, in the next video, which will be the, the exercises for Chapter 6. All right, keep learning, guys.